um, and you will play that um, play that video for me, and I will be right back. This is to get you into the into it. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest extermination center created by the Nazis. It has become the symbol of the Holocaust and of willful, radical evil in our time. The album you will see presented here is known as the Auschwitz album, and it is the only surviving visual evidence of the process of mass murder at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The album is unique. There is not a similar album of its kind in the entire world. It documents, in photos from every direction and from every angle, the arrival at Auschwitz, the selection of those slated for immediate death and of the few who were destined to be slave laborers, the confiscation of their property, and the preparation for the physical annihilation of a transport of Jewish people. This transport of Hungarian Jews from the area of Karpatha, Ruthenia, arrived at the ramp of the extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau in May 1944. In the photos, we see the men, women and children step out of the overcrowded train, traumatized and fearful after their horrendous journey. They have no clue that they have just been delivered to a death factory and that few of them will survive. Survivor and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Elie Wiesel described his arrival as a teenager at Auschwitz. Every yard or so, an SS man held his gun trained on us. Hand in hand, we followed the crowd. Men to the left, women to the right. Eight words spoken, indifferently, without emotion. Eight short, simple words. For a part of a second, I glimpsed my mother and my sister moving to the right. I saw them disappear into the distance while I walked on with my father and the other men. I did not know that at that place, at that moment, I was parting from my mother and my sister forever. The selection process carried out by SS doctors and wardens took place 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as train after train unloaded its human cargo. Most Jews were sent immediately to the left, to their death. The undressing rooms of the gas chambers were not sufficient for the masses of Hungarian Jews who arrived daily in the summer of 1944. They therefore had to wait until the undressing rooms were ready to absorb them. The common waiting place was the grove closest to the crematorium that would soon turn their bodies to ash. They were told to sit among the trees and wait for further instructions. These were their last peaceful moments together before being driven into the gas chambers and murdered. It has been said that there will never be people as innocent as the victims on the threshold of the gas chambers. The SS kept the victims destined for gassing in complete ignorance of what lay in store for them. They were told that before being placed in the camp, they had to be disinfected and washed. They would soon discover that what they had assumed were the shower areas were actually hermetically sealed gas chambers. A minority of Jews was selected for forced labor. Their personal belongings were confiscated, their hair was shaved, and a registration number was tattooed on their left arm. In the words of survivor and author Primo Levi, for the first time we became aware that our language lacks words to express this offense, the demolition of a man. It is not possible to sink lower than this. Nothing belongs to us anymore. They have taken away our clothes, our shoes, even our hair. If we speak, they will not listen to us. And if they listen, they will not understand. They will even take away our name. And if we want to keep it, we will have to find in ourselves the strength to do so. It is in this way that one can understand the double sense of the term extermination camp. 
The work of sorting the possessions that the Jews brought with them to Auschwitz was done by Jewish prisoners who were forced to collect the packages and sort the items that would then be sent to the Reich. By the time the sorting was completed, most of the previous owners were already dead. No memory of the men, women and children that were deemed valueless upon their arrival remains in camp records. This album is the sole witness to their fate. The Auschwitz album was discovered after the war by Lily Jacob, a survivor of the transport pictured here. Lily gave the album to Yad Vashem, where she knew that its tragic contents would be safeguarded for posterity and shared with generations to come. Okay, so thank you very much to all the techie people. Thank you, Morgan, for sharing that. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, hopefully you can see it. Yes, we're good, okay. So, like I said, and that was just to kind of get you into the mindset. You saw a lot of photographs just now, more photographs than I can possibly show you in the course of this presentation. But what, what held true for the last, in the last presentation about those pictures, the photographs, perpetrator photographs from the ghettos is going to hold true for the Auschwitz album also. When we examine the album, we have to remember, yes, it is the only surviving photographic evidence of the process leading to the mass murder of the Jews at Auschwitz. I will just mention, by the way, that there is other surviving photographic evidence. I did not cover, I'm not covering it in this presentation. These are called the Zonderkommando photographs. And actually, um, and this is a link that I didn't send to Morgan, but I can do that afterwards. Um, there was, Yad Vashem used to have a, um, uh, an e-newsletter that we put out and there was an e-newsletter that was expressly dedicated to photography that has a, a few really good articles in it. One of them was about those Zonderkommando photographs. They are photographs of, of um, humans actually being burned when the crematoria did not suffice during that um, Hungarian um, action to burn all the bodies. Um, and uh, that's a whole nother story. That's also very, very interesting photographic evidence. But this album that we're going to talk about now is the only photographic evidence of the process because it stops just short of the doors of the crematorium. In other words, where the Zonderkommando photographs kind of pick up, that's where this one stops. And again, because it's perpetrator testimony, and I'm just showing you here, in um, Echoes and Reflections, there is a unit called The Final Solution. And in The Final Solution, we have testimonies from Auschwitz survivors. We have pictures from the Auschwitz album. Um, but I also wanna show you that on the Yad Vashem website, and then I'll finish the thought that I started. Um, and you can see this is an exhibition. Um, it's it goes, it takes you through the album. This is part of the page that you get to, and you can take a look at that link that's above. It's Yad Vashem. If you just look up on the Yad Vashem website, if you look up Auschwitz album, you'll come to it, no problem. I just wanted to show you this. There is a link to view the entire album. So you can see to view the Auschwitz album, click here. And this exhib exhibition is available in ready to print format. So for those of you who are teachers, um, this is also a great thing because um, it's it's available. You get in touch with Yad Vashem, um, and they can send you these these huge files that can be printed on huge poster size. Uh, I don't know what it's printed on paper, um, and then it becomes a terrific resource for you to use with your students. So, um, for more information, you can just go into the Yad Vashem website. What I was saying, and the, the point that I wanted to make was that just like with other perpetrator pictures, um, you have to hear the voices of the victims. Remember, the, this album, <clears throat> what separates it from a lot of other evidence of mass atrocities um, or, or other photographs from death camps is that 
in these pictures, you see live human beings. You see them as they come into the camp, as you saw, you see them being selected. You see them on their way to the crematorium, to the gas chambers. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> okay. Um, but keep in mind that although we see that in just beautiful pre-war pictures, uh, many of them come from pages of testimony that we have at Yad Vashem, Keep in mind that we may see them as human faces, but the SS didn't. The SS saw them as an anonymous mass. They couldn't have cared less. The point here was to kill them, to exterminate them, to annihilate them. And it's up to us to commemorate them um, and to give them back their identities and their voices. So that's what I'm gonna try and do. I will also tell you, um, before I start, I will also tell you that there has been new research done on the Auschwitz album in the last two years, within the last two years. Um, this research was done over the course of, I think, a five-year period by um, some French historians. Um, and the research is telling us a lot of things that we didn't know before. And even some of the information in the video that you just saw is actually now considered to be incorrect. Um, so I will go through and correct some impressions for you. And I, I, I want to tell you the story of, of how we have this album, because it's one of those incredible stories of providence that you say to yourself, this album fell into our hands for a reason. Okay. Um, so I just want to go through this with you real quickly. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to start Once Upon a Time, although Once Upon a Time, there was a girl, a young girl, an 18-year-old named Lily Jacob, who you saw at the back, back of the movie, which kind of gives things away. But Lily lived with her family in a place called Bilka, which was in Carp Carpatha Rus, um, in the mountains. Um, and Lily's family was, she had a big family, and she, they celebrated holidays together, and they were very traditional Jews. Um, and right around Passover of 1944, um, Lily's family was um, collected and they were, um, they were all brought together. They were put into a ghetto for a very short period of time. Then they were put on cattle cars and they were taken to Auschwitz. Lily gets to Auschwitz and her mother and all of her family is sent to one side and Lily is sent to the other side. Now, nobody understands what this means at, on the ramp, on the platform. Nobody understands what this means at that point. But Lily wants to be with her mother. That's all she knows is that she wants to be with her mother. And she goes running back to be with her mother. And the SS, of course, stop her. Um, there's a knife involved. She actually is wounded by a knife, um, which is a scar that she will have with her for the rest of her life. But they take her and they see she's a healthy 18-year-old. And that's what the Germans were looking for because... The selection process was an issue of, can you work as slave labor for the Germans? If so, then you receive a suspended death sentence um, and you will be kept alive as long as you can be slave labor for the Germans. And if you can't, if you're not healthy, if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, if you have a baby, if you're sick, if you're unwell in some way, if you're too old, if you're too young, you will be sent to the side of immediate death. So Lily is temporarily saved she spends about a year at Auschwitz, a um, little bit less than a year at Auschwitz. And when the camp, before the camp is liberated, she's taken on a death march and she winds up at a camp called Dora Mittelbau. Dora Mittelbau is a camp in Germany um, where a lot of death marches wound up. Lily is very sick in April of 1945 um, and she She's lying in a very crowded barrack and all of a sudden one of her barrack mates says, Lily, you have to see, you have to come to the window and see what's going on outside. There's a big Jeep with a big white star on it and it's the American army. And her friend says, you have to see this. We're being liberated. The Americans are here and Lily gets up and she makes the, the, the huge effort to get up and take a look out the window and then she passes out. Her friends bring her inside, they put her in a barrack. They put her in a barrack that must have belonged to the SS because the SS are no longer there, but the barrack has a bed, it has sheets, and that's something that people in Auschwitz weren't used to. Um, Lily wakes up in the middle of the night because she's running a very high fever, and as you know, when you're running a high fever, you have 
the chills. And so she, there's a bedside cabinet. She opens the cabinet to find something to put over her shoulders to keep her warm. And underneath whatever it is that she finds to put over her shoulders, she finds this album. She opens up the album. And on the first page, and this is the very first page of the album, what you're looking at now, on the very first page of the album, on the right-hand side, she sees this man who is Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Weiss. He is the rabbi of her town of Bilke. So right away, she feels connected to this album and she turns the page. And on one of the next pages, she sees this picture. And in this picture are her two brothers. This is Israel, or Srill, and this is Zelig. And they were both very young. And Lily had not seen them since they were ripped away from her standing on that ramp eight, nine months previous. And she continues turning the page. And she turns the page, and in this picture, she sees her grandparents, Avraham and Shendele. And they are among the group of people that is shunted to the side on the ramp because they would have held up the Germans' process. Um, and they are later taken in trucks directly to the gas chambers. Of course, those trucks had big, um, sometimes they had crosses on them. Also, the crosses with red trucks on the ramp were used to actually hold the Zyklon B, Zyklon B that was used in the gas chamber. So those are two of her grandparents. And of course you saw this picture where Lily herself features right in the front row. This is on the same day that she arrives, she has already been shaved. She has already been stripped of everything that she owns. She's been stripped of her name, her possessions. She's wearing clothing that, belong, that belonged to someone else. Um, that's Lily, 18 years old. And Lily sees all of these pictures in the album and she feels that this album is connected to her. She needs to keep this album safe. It's part of her now. It's fate that has held, that has brought the album into her hands. If you don't know this website, I would like to introduce it to you now. This is called Eyewitness um, by USC Shoah Foundation, which again is a partner in Echoes and Reflections. And they are the ones who gave us their testimony. These are testimonies that were taken, if you remember Schindler's List and you remember Steven Spielberg and how involved he became in collecting testimony from survivors of the Holocaust, excuse me, then you will understand that what the USC Shoah Foundation did was they collected, they have 1,500 out of many thousands of testimonies on this, 1,500 testimonies on this website that they have indexed in all kinds of different ways you can see by gender, by experience group, by language, by country, by, by genocide. There are testimonies from Armenia and there are testimonies from Rwanda, there are testimonies from Cambodia. And Lily Jacob, who was later known as Lily Mayer, um, Lily's testimony can be found there. So if you want to hear the testimony, it's free by the way to use, all you have to do is log in and you know, use a, get a password, um, free to teachers. And if you do want to hear Lily's testimony about how she found that album, you can look for clip 21 and you will be able to hear her tell the story of how she found this album. So now you understand how this album fell into Lily's hands. It was so important to her that when she crossed borders, she hid it under her daughter's, um, in her daughter's baby carriage, under the mattress of her daughter's baby carriage. That is her daughter. And later she gave it to Yad Vashem. You saw this picture. I want to read the dedication to you. September 16th, 1982 to Yad Vashem. In deepest and eternal gratitude for keeping the memory of the six million parents, brothers, and sisters alive from a surviving sister who is grateful to have been able to aid your mission in a small measure. May it never happen again, and may it never be forgotten. And you can see, this always gets me because it's so personal, and you can see that the handwriting is shaky and from a surviving sister because she lost her whole family. So I'll calm down, and we'll get back to the um, analysis that we're trying to do. So we talked in the last session about how to analyze a photograph. But now you have another layer because think about the last time you put together a photo album, okay? I'm putting one together now for a vacation that I took with my family last year and I'm still not done with it. 
you have to get it exactly right. You're going to arrange those photographs the way you want them. Do you want them to be chronologically? Do you want them to tell a certain story? So with respect to this album, in addition to analyzing the photographs themselves, we also have to analyze the album because it's arranged. There was a hand here. It didn't, the pictures didn't spring into the album all by themselves. We have to figure out what this album is trying to do. And that's what the research is about. And that's what makes it so interesting because for years, people thought that the album was put together maybe to show the efficiency of the process, but that maybe it was some kind of souvenir for somebody who was there. Um, nobody really understood. We knew who the photographers were, but we didn't understand why the, why the pictures were put in an album. Now we have a much better understanding because of these um, historians who painstakingly went through picture after picture after picture and found out a lot of new information. So these are the questions we're going to have to ask. What does this album show? What doesn't it show? And why was it made at all? So I'm going to try and take you through a little bit. And I'm going to go back to that first picture. And you see the title on the page, Umsiedlung der Juden aus Ungarn, which means the resettlement of the Jews of Hungary. What is that? What, why is this so important? It's important because this isn't just an album about Auschwitz. No, this is an album specifically about the, um, the, a, the action of the Jews <clears throat> with respect to the Jews of Hungary. This was the biggest action. Let me put this in perspective for you. Auschwitz starts off as a concentration camp in 1940. June of 1940 are the first prisoners who arrive. Most of them are Polish prisoners. And it's not a big deal, really. It becomes, um, it starts to become an extermination camp only in 1942. So it's continuing as a concentration camp on the one hand, as an extermination camp on the other. But there are are extermination camps that were more efficient, that, were, that worked faster. For instance, if I tell you that the camp of Treblinka, in that camp, in 13 months time, there were over 870,000 Jews that were killed in that camp. The first couple of years that Auschwitz was operating as an extermination camp, it wasn't that big a deal, really. And it's only with, if we use the number 1.1 million as the number of Jewish victims that were exterminated, killed, murdered at Auschwitz in its, during its history, then if I tell you that there were over 430,000 Jews of Hungary, just Hungary, just this action that we're talking about, this resettlement action of the Jews of Hungary, then you already understand that that's more than a third of the victims of Auschwitz were brought to Auschwitz during this resettlement action of the Hungarian Jews, okay? So that's where Auschwitz really becomes a monster. And I'll also tell you, that this 430,000 number, um, 430,000 Jews were brought, 90% of them were killed in the space of 56 days, okay? And that's a huge difference from a place like Treblinka, where, where it took 13 months to kill all of those people. So this is a very important piece of German history, and it turns out that this is why the album was made. Now, take a look at a page like this. This says arrival of a transport, okay? And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about these pictures because you can see already that they have different vantage points. The bottom one is taken kind of at ground level while the top two, obviously, the photographer was standing on the roof of those cattle cars. These are the cattle cars coming in. So let's examine one in a little bit more depth, okay? As the people come off the cattle car, you can see it's been described as um, a river rushing for a bank. And that's, that was described by Tadeusz Borowski, who was a Polish, um, a, a Polish reader who actually worked in Auschwitz on the ramp, which is, the ramp is what this, uh, area of the camp is called. It's really also a train station because sometimes, as you saw, there's more than one train that comes in. Um, so you see the photographer must have been standing up on the roof of the car. He is photographing all of this mass of people who are coming out of the train. But 
think about this for a second. What is it that he's showing us? I'm going to give you some clues here. Okay, here, here come some arrows. Take a look, and you talked about this yesterday with Liz when Liz did the, the Felix Nussbaum picture of the refugee for you. Where is your eye going? The, remember the table, if you were at the lecture yesterday, the table and the point that was coming to a point taking you into the background of the picture. This is, you are looking at the flow towards the back of the camp. Well, why is that important? What is at the back of the camp? And so what you will see is on the left side and on the right side, mirror images of each other. These are actually the buildings of the gas chambers and the crematoria. This is gas chamber and crematoria number two on the left and number three on the right. Why do we start from number two? Because gas chamber number one is back at Auschwitz. This is actually the Birkenau camp. If I haven't said that yet, then I will say it now, excuse me. Auschwitz was a monstrosity. It was three main camps, Auschwitz one, which was the mother camp, which is where the first gas chamber was. Auschwitz II, also called Birkenau, um, Birkenau for the birch trees that were there before everything was obliterated, and Auschwitz III, or Buna Manowitz, which was a, basically a complex of, an industrial complex. So what you're looking at here is, is Birkenau. You're looking at the gas chambers number two and number three. And obviously, the photographer who took this picture had a sense of how to compose the picture, because look what he did. He got both of those gas chambers symmetrically in the background, and he's got the, the, the uh, rail lines on one side and the train on the other side, drawing your eye to the back of that picture, which is very interesting, because you don't really ever think about the composition of the pictures. In this picture where you see two trains already, one of them, um, presumably, the people have already been, they have already come and gone, because you can see, um, things that they have left on the ramp. Um, and the other one, I'm not sure whether it has been loaded or unloaded yet, uh, or is about to be unloaded. Um, but the, it's the same composition, the same drawing of your eyes to the background. So let's remember that the photographer was a professional. He was a professional German photographer. We know that there were at least two photographers that were involved in this process, Ernst Hoffman and Bernhard Walter, both of whom worked as photographers at Birkenau, why at Auschwitz Birkenau? Why do you need photographers there um, to take prisoner pictures uh, for other reasons? Um, these guys were there for a mission. They were taking the pictures in this album. We know that they had access to the roofs of the cattle cars. They were visible. They had free reign to go wherever they want. And the bottom line is, they are taking these panoramic pictures of an anonymous mass of people that was going to be killed, okay? But at the same time, they are ignoring the individual suffering that's going on right below them. So let me go back to this picture. If he was standing on this cattle car, he's looking at the composition of the picture. He is not looking to see what's happening in this picture itself. And I'll just give you a little tidbit, okay? Take a look where the circle is. Most of the people in this picture are facing the back. Now, there are a lot of interesting things going on in this picture, and I have to say that one of the best, best, best activities to do in a class when you're using the visuals from this Auschwitz album is to just let it marinate. Put it up on a screen or you know, up on the screen in the classroom or the screen virtually, and let people pick out the things that they see because Everyone is going to pick up something else. Everyone sees another little detail that maybe you never saw before. And this has happened to me a lot of times when I've used these pictures in seminars and somebody always sees something that it's new to me. So if you take a look at the picture, at the people that I have in this circle, what you see is a woman who came on the transport and you see her talking to a prisoner. You can tell that by his uniform. And this is a prisoner from the Canada Commando. What's the Canada Commando? The Canada Commando are those people whose job it was, first of all, to get to the ramp, to get everybody out of the cattle cars, to make sure that everybody was orderly. And then later on, they are going to collect 
all of the things that are left behind on the ramp, they're going to bring it to Canada. What was Canada? Canada was the warehouse. There was one in Auschwitz, there was one in Birkenau. Why are they, why is it called Canada if it was a warehouse? That's not what the Germans called it. The Germans called it the Effektenlager, which means the uh, camp of personal effects. But Canada was, it was known as Canada by the prisoners. This is prisoner slang because the prisoners thought of Canada as this land of plenty. And that's what there was in these warehouses. These warehouses were full of the things that were brought by, um, by these people with them to, to Auschwitz-Birkenau because of course they were never told, we're going to kill you, bring all your possessions. They were told, we're going to resettle you in the East. They were, they were told, you're going to, you know, we're going to take you to a place where you'll start life again. They were never told the truth. So if you ever go to Auschwitz, and I'm sure some of you have, you will see displays of combs and shoe polish and pots and pans and all of the things that people brought with them because they believed that they were going to start their lives over again. So the man from Commando Canada is apparently telling this woman something. Now, already we know this is forbidden because the, the prisoners on Commando Canada could have been killed. And you, by, by the way, you see some more of them towards the middle of the picture who are, they are watching. Um, you can see them standing in the middle to the left. Uh, there's a whole group of them. They're watching, waiting for these people to move so that they can collect um, anything that was left behind. And what is he telling her? We don't know. We will never know. But we do know that this is a moment of human interaction. We know that it's going on right below the photographer's feet. And he is not really aware of it because he is concentrating on getting that angle and that composition correct. So we're going to go back to things like that in a second. But I want to show you some more pictures. These are pictures of the selection. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of pictures of selection in the album. First of all, you'll see that it was men on one side and women on the other side. You'll see sometimes, um, and you can take a look at the Canada people in this picture. They're the, uh, of course, the guys with the stripes as opposed to the Germans who you can see very easily. Um, sometimes they're helping people. Sometimes they're talking to people. They were supposed to line people up, get them assembled. Um, but sometimes they were also passing on messages you will see that the women's line is much shorter than the men's line. You will see that the men are watching the women, but they are helpless to do anything about it. So when this photographer took this picture, he wasn't thinking of all the human emotions. He wasn't thinking of what's gonna to happen to that little girl on the left. Do you see her in the coat? I should have circled her. She's obviously going with her mother because she's holding hands with her mother, um, right towards the middle of the picture on the left. What's going to happen to her? What is she thinking? What is her mother thinking? Where, where are they thinking that they are? What are they thinking is going to happen next? But, and you can see the men. What if their wives are there or their daughters? And they're thinking, how are we going to get back together with them? How are we going to find them afterwards? The photographer isn't thinking of any of this stuff. He doesn't care about the human story. There's a real human drama unfolding here. That's not his thing. He cares about the efficiency, he cares about the selection. And that's what you see going on in this picture. If you see the German right in the middle of the screen, he's got his one finger, and that is how he is going to say, you are going to your death immediately. Of course, he doesn't say those words, you go to the left and you go to the right is what he's gesturing with his finger. You go to that side and you go to that side. One side will be immediate death and the other side will mean a suspended death sentence because those people will be used as slave labor. Um, that's a German who was identified uh, in the museum uh, by actually by a group of tourists, um, one of whom was his son. Um, his father had never told him that he was a guard at Auschwitz and this man came into the Auschwitz Museum where this picture is prominently displayed on a wall and looked up and said, oh my God, that's my father. So there are all kinds of dramas going on here, all kinds of human stories. But next to that man, again, is the German who is performing the selection. Now understand, the German performing the selection is always a doctor. 
and that is to lend some kind of credibility to this because the idea is you are getting rid of the pollutants you are getting rid of the people who can't work you're getting rid of the of the you know you're you're ridding the world of these horrible genes etc cetera, etc cetera. if you can't see his finger in that red circle then take a look at the shadow and you will see it much more clearly so these are pictures of selection now also when you look at a picture like this take a look at the people who are walking okay the people at the top of the screen and the people at the top of the screen to the right there's already a group of people who's moving that's moving in one certain direction and take a look at the spaces between the people and that will give you an idea of how quickly these germans made the decision about who was going to basically live for a little while at least and who was going to die immediately the spaces between them are not that great so you see there's one person walking right under the window of that building then there's another person coming up on the left and behind him there's someone else you, you understand what i'm saying you get a sense of time now i want to bring you back because we've been looking at these pictures from the German point of view. I want to remind you that these are perpetrator pictures. Because they're perpetrator pictures, you have to try very hard to hear the victims. In, these situ in this situation, we don't have photographs other than the Zonderkommando photographs that I mentioned. We don't have photographs taken by the victims at Auschwitz, of course, because everything was taken from them and they are lining up They've left their suitcases um, and, and they have nothing. Um, so they had no cameras. What we do have though are testimonies of the survivors, sorry. Um, and we owe it to them to think about who they were, where they came from, how they lived, who loved them. We owe it to them to spend a little time, even if we never know their names, even if we can only wonder about them. And actually, I read an interesting statistic today preparing for this lecture, which, which said that 75% of the people in the album have actually already been identified, which is amazing. Um, but we owe it to them to see them as human beings, which was not the way the SS saw them. The SS saw them as objects. We owe it to them to think about who they were and what they were experiencing. So in this photograph, what you see is a, a little girl, a girl who was 13 years old, and you can see I put a picture of her at the top. Um, this is Irene Fogel, who later became Weiss. She was actually separated from her entire family. She was holding on to her younger sister, and she was sent to the side of death, immediate death. She was sent with her mother and her younger sister. And she, you can see in the uh, text, she was just stunned because she was, she had also come with her older sister, Serena, who she idolized. And in a kind of a split second decision, human drama, right? She ran over and nobody stopped her, I guess. She ran over to where Serena was and Serena had been sent to the side of labor. Um, forced labor, and that was what saved her life. So this is just one of the stories. But again, take a look at a picture like this. First of all, this was a huge transport. There were probably 2,000 people to 3,000 people on this transport. Take a look at the truck that's coming up on the right-hand side. Take a look at all the feverish work that's already been do being done by the Canada Commando. Take a look at that pile of objects that's growing and growing and growing um, and you see what the operation was here and that's why these pictures are being taken to show how efficient an operation it was let's go back you remember srul and zelig right those were lee jacob's two brothers take a look at them for a second in this case these are these are kids they're both under 13 years old i think they're nine and eleven and the camera being pointed at them is really a weapon. If we said before that the Nazis called their photograph com companies in the field weapons, this is really a weapon. It's a pitiless weapon. It shows no remorse. And take a look at Zelig's face and his body language. He, his face is contorted, right? He's grimacing. He's scared. He doesn't know what's about to happen to him. And look at his, look at his fingers. His fingers, his, 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 his hand is kind of balled up. He's, he's 
he wants to grip something. He's okay. Because, and this is all fear that you see being projected. Um, so that's also, when you look at these pictures, you have to understand, take a look in the background. Who is that woman with the baby on her lap? What is she thinking about? Where is she thinking that she's going? What does she think she's reached? She's come to, is this the land that the Germans promised to send her to, to be resettled? What about her daughter? What's going to happen to her? I want to go back to Israel and Zelig for a second because I want to show you something very interesting. If you take a close-up of Israel's face, and again, he's nine years old in this picture, the Auschwitz Museum has done something really interesting, and they actually use his eyes in their logo. I found this out just the other day. Those are his eyes. Take a look at the two pictures and you will see that they are the same because the idea is that he's not a victim and not a witness. He's an accuser and he is accusing the Germans and commemorating at the same time. So I think that's extraordinary what they've done with a picture like that. Okay, so let's go back into the album. What you're seeing, the, the pictures from the ramp and selection. This is just a map to give you an idea again. Um, you can see the ramp, the red circle is where the, uh, the trains are unloaded. And if you look right back to that rail, all the way to the top, well, not to the top, but you can see gas chamber and crematoria number two and number three. I should have circled them. Um, and on the other side, um, you'll see Canada. It's underlined in red. Take a look at how many barracks. Those are all barracks, those little rectangles. Take a look at how many barracks were in Canada. Um, and, and an incredible amount of theft is what it was, um, and people's personal possessions. And then if you look to the right of Canada, you see gas chamber and crematorium number four and five. That's just to orient you, okay? And again, we're going back to these ramp pictures. Again, there is so much to pick up. Um, you can see, first of all, look at the train. Um, look how high off the ground it is, right? The people who are inside, you can see they need help getting out. Think about this for a second, that pe people who had a long journey, for instance, the Greek Jews who came from Salonika, it took sometimes eight days and eight nights to get to Auschwitz. And they're sitting in very cramped conditions. Um, usually on the side of the rail car, you will see a number. It looks to me, if you take a look at that handwritten note on the side of the door, the siding, it looks to me like the number here is 71. So there are 71 human beings crammed into this cattle car that is meant to hold six cows or six horses, right? And if these people have come on an eight day, eight night journey from Salonika and they have been cramped and sitting, when they get up and those doors open suddenly and there's light shining in their faces and they're hearing, they're hearing all kinds of things outside, and then to come out of the train car, will they be able to stand up, number one? And will they be, be able to jump down by themselves? So there are, there's a lot of information here. Um, of course, the little children in the foreground of the picture and what's gonna happen to them. We know that children at Auschwitz are a death sentence for their mothers because they are, they are valueless to the Germans. If they can't work for the Germans, there's no reason for them to be kept alive. Um, so these mothers, presumably with their children, will be among those victims. I, I see that rapidly my time is, is, the clock is ticking, so I'm just going to keep moving. Um, again, women were always separated from men. There's a lot of information in this picture, too. Who were these women? Where did they come from? What about that Canada guy on the side? And we're going to get to some of the testimonies. Another classic picture of selection, women on one side, men on the other side. And again, this one was taken from the top of a cattle car. The little children in this picture um, who are adorable, who are innocent, who are, um, were killed for no other reason than because they were Jewish. That's not what the photographer wants here. The photographer here doesn't care about these people. He cares about showing, look how efficient we are. We got them to line up. We got them to stand still. Um, and this is how we do it, right? This is how the, the great uh, German, the SS, this is how we conduct this whole great resettlement of the Hungarian Jews. Just some random pictures. Now, let me tell you something, okay? And this also comes from this recent research. Every Holocaust museum in the world 
has these pictures. Sometimes they are blown up to huge proportions, mounted on the walls of the museum. Yad Vashem has them. The Auschwitz Museum has them. Gail, I don't know if your center has them, but they're probably there somewhere. Um, the question is, what is the story that they're telling? Are they telling the real story? And are they telling the whole story? Because the whole story is the story of human beings. And that's the story that they're not telling. So let's look behind the pictures. You've seen enough pictures. Let's look behind them to bring in the voices of the victims. We're gonna use testimonies, even though these are the tiny, tiny minority of the Jews who reached Auschwitz, because we estimate in some transports, Nobody was left alive. Everybody was sent automatically to the gas chamber. In some cases, it's 85%. In some cases, it's 90%. The great majority of the Jews who reached Auschwitz were murdered on arrival. Within a couple of hours, there was nothing left of them. And it's, so it's the tiny, tiny minority whose voices we're going to hear. And the first thing I'm going to show you, this comes right out of Echoes and Reflections. Those of you who teach literature, of course, will be familiar with this. This is an excerpt from Night by Elie Wiesel, who reached Auschwitz. When he was Hi, Cheryl. Sorry to interrupt. Hi. But yeah, this, is your ten, this is your 10 minute warning. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so either I talk faster or I show less. Uh, we'll try and do a little bit of both. This is the excerpt from Night where Elie Wiesel says, the beloved objects we had carried with us from place to place were left behind in the wagon and with them finally our illusions. Every few yards, there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us. Hand in hand, we followed the throng and SS came toward us wielding a club. He commanded, men to the left, women to the right. Eight words spoken quietly and differently without emotion, eight simple short words, yet that was the moment when I left my mother. And I'm skipping down a little bit, which it pains me. Behind me, an old man fell to the ground. Nearby, an SS man replaced his revolver in its holster. My hand tightened its grip on my father. All I could think of was not to remain alone. Okay, so that's one testimony that we have. This is the testimony from the Yad Vashem archives. Whoever tried to describe this didn't describe anything. I don't know who can. It was the end of the world. The Inferno of Dante, that's a pale description. The trains arrived on a platform, it was drizzling, everybody was screaming. There was a noise which was unbelievable. The Germans, they were saying schneller, 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 that means faster in German. But kids were crying, people were crying, I heard noises, I got deaf. At some stage I heard myself screaming. I don't know what happened. I screamed like, I don't know why, it came from you, like unconscious and everybody was screaming. Somebody was saying something because people were also calling names, trying to stay together didn't find anyone. I didn't see my mother nor my father, anyone. We were kicked and kicked and we were running, just running. You're already hearing things that you did not see in those pictures. And if I had the time to play Ellis Lewin's testimony, um, it's a couple of minutes, it's a few minutes long. So very sadly, I'm not gonna take the time to do it. Maybe I should. Maybe I should play you just one testimony. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go into that Echoes and Reflections website that I keep telling you about, okay? And I am going to the Teach section, which is right here. This website is so easy to use, you'll figure it out in a second. I'm going into Teach. Once I go into Teach, you will see that the left rail opens up and first of all, you have the pedagogy for instruction, which I showed you in the first session right here, and then you have lesson plans. Click on lesson plans and you will see all of these units, 11 units that open up and I'm going to go, whoops, that was not the one I wanted. Slip of the finger. I'm going to go to the final solution unit because that's where this material is. You already saw this when you marched out, you never knew who would come back. This is the lesson plan. This, this uh, unit has two lesson plans in it. You can see the first one is about the victims and the struggle to survive because it's very important for us to tell you about that. And that's where Ellis Lewin's testimony is, which is right here on the right rail. Now you're never going to, when you play a testimony in class, you're never gonna just play it. Think about if you had a real live human being who was a survivor in your classroom, you would never say, okay, Ellis, this is my class, start talking. No, you would tell them about him. You would make him into a real person because these people were people or are people and they had 
histories before and their hist histories after. So what we do for you is we give you a whole biography that I am not going to go into now. Actually, it ties in very nicely with our first section session because Ellis was born in Lodz and he was deported to Auschwitz when he was a young a boy. He was a boy. So with that tiny little bit of introduction, I'm going to play Ellis Lewin's invaluable testimony. And take a listen, and you will hear certain things repeating. It's as though he goes back to what he felt when he was a boy. When we arrived to Auschwitz, the minute they opened the wagons, it was just total, complete uh, misery, beatings and screamings and beatings and barking of dogs and growling of dogs and and whistles of trains and screaming and beating and screaming and and the commands given it was just it was just like you open the doors and all of a sudden you find yourself in this inferno in this in this in this in this unimaginable uh, 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 horror that you as a adult or a child uh, would see nightmares and it was just coming through uh, and we were just hauling on to each other, and and uh, I don't know, within minutes, my mother and my sister were dragged to one side, and I was dragged with my dad to another. We were told to go to another side. And uh, they never had a chance to say goodbye to my mother, never had a chance to say goodbye to my sister. Uh, the, 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 uh, the pace, the speed of this, this thing, it was done by design. It was done to, to both for, for the person not to be able to comprehend or understand or, or in any way be able to think for a second what was happening. It was just incredible. It was just an incredible uh, situation. And uh, it was just, as I tell it to you now, it's difficult for me to even describe it because it was happening on a on a minute to minute uh, situation and uh, i got into the i got into this line it was this big line and uh, i saw my mother on the other side it was a, another side where the women went and uh, I, I i never saw her cry. I don't, I never saw her reach out. She just, the last time I saw her, she was hanging on to my sister. And my dad hollered to her, you hang, you, you take care of her, I'll take care of him, in Yiddish. And uh, whatever we have to do, this was the last word I heard. And uh, my dad threw me in front of him. And uh, he says, keep walking very tall, don't even, because we were observing what was going on in the front, you know, in the front of the lines. And uh, the, very, the one thing you didn't want is for the Germans to, to see that you were holding on to your child, because that was the whole idea, is to break up the family, murder the family. Uh, that was the genocide of the whole thing. So by not identifying that this is your child, there was a little bit of an edge you had to possibly survive. The fact that you were on your own and you sort of didn't belong to any family. Okay. Let me get out of here. So that's a very powerful testimony. And he says a lot of things in that testimony. Um, first of all, if you consider the fact Let's take the, the back first, and I'm going to talk really fast. The fact that he, his father throws him in front, throws this little boy in front of him, says to him, stand up tall, and pushes him away. The, a parent's instinct is never to put a child in front. It's to protect the child. Think how this father was acting against every instinct that he had, okay, just to save his child. And now let's go back and I'm only going to pick up a couple of points from this testimony, but he repeats the words at the beginning of the testimony, the beating and the screaming and the beating and the barking of dogs and the screaming and the beating. He repeats those a number of times, obviously it made a very, very strong impression on him. Okay. So keep that in mind for a second. And you should start to wonder now, 
wait a second, let's go, let's go, wait, let's go back to all of these selection pictures. Do you see any beating? No. Do you see any barking of dogs? No. Do you see anyone screaming? No. Everybody seems to be standing in line. Everything is very relaxed. Everything is exactly the way it should be going if you're a model of efficiency. But that's not what Elie Wiesel tells us, right? Elie Wiesel says, a few yards there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us. And he talks about an old man being shot as he watched. And that's not what Betty Parkal is telling us. Everyone was screaming, right? And people are calling names. And that's not what Ellis Lewin is telling us. The beating and the screaming and the beating and the screaming and the barking of dogs. So how do we know what's going on in these pictures? Why don't these pictures show us what these eyewitnesses are telling us? There's a huge disconnect here. Okay, and so I'm gonna introduce another resource to you. This resource is actually only available from Auschwitz, as far as I know, from the museum. Hopefully on their website, you can get in and you can actually purchase it. I didn't send Morgan a link, I'm sorry. Um, this is a sketchbook. This sketchbook has pictures in it. Uh, wait, let me stay there for a second. And it has pictures in it, 22 pages worth of pictures. Were drawn by a prisoner in Auschwitz, in the camp, we don't know who he was. He signs all the pictures MM. That's all we know about him. Very mysterious. He must have been at the camp for a very long time because most of the sketchbook is about daily life in the camp. He shows what daily life was like, what roll call was like, what uh, work was like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also know that he, this is the last picture in the sketchbook looks like it was unfinished, right? He could have been murdered. He could have been found while he was trying to uh, hide it. Something happened here, but it's like finishing a diary that stops in the middle of a sentence. This sketchbook stops in the middle of a picture um, and it's unfinished. We know that MM, whoever he or she was, hid those pictures in a glass bottle and buried them in the B2F compound in one of the barracks there. And this sketchbook, tells us a lot of very interesting things. So if you take a look at these two pictures, okay? I'm gonna give you a close up. This is on one page of the sketchbook. This is picture A. This is the arrival of a transport. Look what's going on here, okay? This is another eyewitness. You can see the soldier with the gun. You can see the German who's screaming orders. And actually on the right hand side that I didn't circle, you can see another German with a gun. Let's look at the next picture. You can see a lot of acts of violence in this picture. People being taken away from their families. Again, soldiers with guns are everywhere on this ramp. This is unbelievable. So what happened here? And this is another picture in the sketchbook with those people who are going away from the selection now in which you can actually see a dog. So what's going on? How come there's no violence? There are 197 pictures in the Auschwitz album. They are posted on every wall in every Holocaust museum in the universe. Are they telling us the whole story? Apparently not, because we know that they were actually made by the SS for the SS, and that's key. And this is, again, according to this new research, there were at least 15 copies of this album that were made. Remember what li the cover of Lily's album looks like? The album that Lily found, well, I'm not gonna go back and show it to you because it'll take too long. You'll see it again. Um, look at the cover of this album. It's beautiful, it's bound, it has a picture on it. The name of the regiment, the whole SS, you know, the, the symbol with the eagle. The way the, post, the photos are pasted in is the narrative that the SS wants to get across. And the person who's compiling the album and the person who took the photographs, what they want to show is the efficiency of the murder of the Hungarian Jews. That's the point of this album, which we never understood before. And if they're trying to show efficiency, then all the screaming and the beating and the yelling and the barking of dogs and the people with the guns, that's not gonna make it into the album because that's not what the SS are interested in. But we are interested in it. So we have to examine, again, the other, other sources from other victims. So we have the sketchbook. Just one real quick picture, because um, I see the time. Time is running short. I know, I know, I know. It's running very short. Yes, right um, after this, one quick picture. Mike, if you would just pick up on your part. 
and I'll do so, the thank you and all that at the end. Go, Cheryl, your one last picture. Okay, so if, if, it's, if I'm limited to one last picture, then I'm not going to use this picture. Um, if I'm limited to one last picture, then I'm going to tell you that a lot of these Canada men on the ramp, what they were doing was they were telling the women, give the children to the old people. Because the Canada people knew, the Canada prisoners knew that children were a death sentence. So they told the, the women who were holding children, give them to the older people. Um, and I, I want to tell you, this is, this is detail from that picture that you were seeing, which looks like maybe a woman is taking a child. You can see the Canada commando person right there. Looks like maybe this woman is taking a child um, from someone else. But I can tell you that in this picture, if you take a look at this woman, this is Rosa. Um, this is from testimony that we have from, uh, that was right in this, in Cecily Klein Pollock. And what Rosa, what Cecily says, she came to Auschwitz with her mother and, um, her mother, um, her mother was in the cattle car. Her mother had the presence of mind to ask the Canada commando, what's going to happen to us. Now, um, Cecily's sister had a baby whose name was Danny and that's Danny in the picture. Um, and Rosa, when she heard what was about to happen, she jumped out of the cattle car. Her daughter with the baby had already jumped out. Um, Mina, I think was her name. And she went over, she had the presence of mind and the clarity of thought to go over to her daughter and say to her, darling, look, you know they're gonna make us all work very hard and all you're gonna have to do is take care of Danny. So give Danny to me and I will take care of him. And then they won't make me work as hard. Now you understand that what she's doing is she's condemning herself to death and she's saving her daughter's life by taking Danny away from her daughter. And that's what you see in the picture. And Gail, I have to, I can't, I, I can't, my heart will break. Trust me, my heart will break if I don't show you this one more picture. Please, please, you please. Heard, we don't want, I want any broken hearts. Okay. You heard about the Grove and the Grove was the place um, that these people were taken to, just some pictures here, that these people were taken to sometimes to wait because there were so many Hungarian Jews who came all at the same time that there wasn't any room in the crematorium and they were told to sit and to wait because they actually had to, they didn't know what they were waiting for, but they were told that they had to wait. This is the picture that I want you to see, and this is the picture on which I will end because this is the perfect example of how in a perpetrator picture, you have to pay attention to the voice and to the victim. If you have very, very good eyes, you will see that people who are all basically waiting for their deaths, all Jews from Hungary, all waiting for their death, not knowing what's about to happen to them, they're sitting in the grass. What is the instinct of a little child who is sitting in the grass? The instinct of that child is going to be to pick a flower and to give it to his brother, to somebody in his family. This is when we talk about innocence, the innocence of these victims right at the door of the gas chamber. So that's, my, that's the picture that I want you to have in your mind. Um, and that's what I'll end with. And this so is thank you all. So powerful. You could do a whole teaching unit just on this photograph. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Mike, mm -hmm. I think we have time for one question, unfortunately. Oh, uh, no, is that that's all? a good thing. It's okay. It's a very good thing. So maybe one, uh, definitely one, maybe two, and uh, a summation from Dr. Hayes, and then I need like the last three minutes. Thank you, Mike. Right. And I'll go for, forego the summation so we can get to as many questions as possible. I'm sorry that we won't be able to ask all of them because there are several good ones, many good ones. Uh, as well as some great comments that we'll share with you, uh, Cheryl. Um, uh, so one of the ones I'd like to start with is uh, whether you could make any connections between the Auschwitz album uh, and the Karl Herka album. Um, and and uh, several people commented on that. Some people are familiar with it. 
Absolutely. So Carl, the Carl Hooker album is an album at the USHMM. Um, it was uh, it was given to the USHMM. It has pictures. The, the, we know that the photographer was Carl Hooker, who was um, he was an adjutant at Auschwitz, which means he held a very high position. And the, the pictures are basically of the uh, SS's free time, not not usually the pictures of when they're working, but when they're free. So for instance, there are pictures of sing-alongs, there are pictures of them eating blueberries, there are pictures of them resting at a place called Solahute, which was where the SS went to vacation. And the thought that what is happening in those pictures is going on at the same, very same time as what is happening during the Lily Jacob album or the Auschwitz album pictures kind of makes you, it makes you crazy a little bit because here were these SS who were having such a good time when they had time off while these 430,000 people were being shipped in, exterminated and, you know, and, and done with, um, done away with. Yeah, and, um, and there are, you can find the, the Hooka album on the USHMM website. You can also find a comparison of the two albums. If you Google them, you will be able to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, you, from Judy Fogel, I believe. Uh, you speak of the album as documenting a pride in the efficiency, and et cetera. I feel that there's also a pride in the treatment and it is a mistreatment of Jews that is documented in propaganda photos that you talked about this morning earlier. Yeah, uh, um, but that's, that's, that's the interesting thing is you don't really see the mistreatment. I mean, when you compare the, the photos in the album to the violence that all of the survivors speak about, you don't see that at all. And for a really long time, we believed that it was because um, they were, they were, these people were being threatened. But now we know that it's just, that was not what happened. We, you know, these pictures are icons for us. We have them in our heads. We believe this was what happened at Auschwitz when people got there. But apparently the truth is much, much different. The photographers made the selection process stop they halted it. They got up on the roofs of those cattle cars. They took the pictures that they wanted to take. They made those people stand there and wait. And then they, and they showed a, a truth that is very different from the truth that actually was. All right, I think that's all the time that we have uh, for questions. Uh, I will say just a couple of things very quickly. First of all, really important, excellent presentation. I think everything that you've done, Cheryl, uh, shows how far we've come in thinking about how we use the materials, the sources that are available to us uh, as uh, set with as much sensitivity as possible. This wasn't always the case. These photos were often thrown out there in media and everything else, including right after liberation and whenever they were discovered, uh, without the context that's so absolutely essential. And I'm so grateful that you and others have put so much work into making sure that that sensitivity uh, has filtered down into the teaching um, in our uh, schools and, and at, at our universities. Uh, so again, uh, thank you. Um, if I could, just a couple, like a minor point. Um, sure. One of the things that I always like to point out if I use photographs, especially from the Auschwitz album, is um, you know, that it's a point in time also, right? Uh, and uh, since it's uh, the spring of and early summer of uh, 1944, you know, these are Jews who arrived at Birkenau when there was a train track that went into the camp, when there was the rail siding there, whereas most of those who who'd arrived, because who, in other words, those who arrived earlier, uh, they were marched yeah. in uh, through the gate. Absolutely. So, they, you know, very different experiences. And so, when you read uh, memoirs, you hear testimonies. Uh, that's why they sometimes seem different from one another in terms of how that arrival takes place, right? That's um, absolutely true as far as location. But I think. Um, yes, every arrival is going to be different depending on the guards who are on duty and how aggressive they were, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the same type of beating, screaming, shock, trauma, it was always present, no matter whether it was on the Judenrampe or on the ramp that went into the camp in 44. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and then finally, the, uh, the Canada... Um, inmates, right, and the way that they were trying to help, but at the same time, they had to be very careful about what information they shared for lots of different reasons. And it shows that, that those awful situations that uh, people, the victims have been put in, 
um, because they're Excellent. assisting the process, but they're also trying to be as humane as possible with the other victims, including those who are going straight to their death. Um, mm -hmm. Really powerful stuff. So again, uh, thank you. And there are many, many other uh, expressions of gratitude uh, in the comments. Uh, so um, Gail, would you like to? Yes, I will be the concluder and just say that building on what you said, we often use in the classroom Lawrence Lanker's term of choiceless choices. And um, our students sometimes have choiceless choices to make. And uh, they can, they're all different ways of them relating to using photography, including, I know that, for example, at Atlantic City High School, they have a photography class. The students get, I believe, cameras. Uh, and so, uh, and most of our students have phones now and they're taking pictures. So there's ways to relate the past to the present, to the future. And Cheryl, I just wanna say that what I got from today is using photography to think about who was taking the picture, who is in the picture, and hear the voices of the victims. And that's been, it, it was terrific, thank you. Thank you so much. So several of you wrote uh, private chats to me. Oh, wow, this was fabulous. This was my first day. How can I sign up for tomorrow? So I'm gonna ask Morgan afterwards to please uh, resend the uh, notice for tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day. And tomorrow has two segments. One is uh, using poetry. Um, and the other is using film. And we have two uh, scholars, experts, educators from Yad Vashem that will be sharing this with us. Um, keep in touch. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help you. And again, thank you to our sponsors. I will not repeat them other than that live from Jerusalem, Yad Vashem. Today, yes, we couldn't have done it without Irvin and Morgan. That's for sure. But I have to say, we could not have done this whole series without Cheryl. Can we all just give her a shout out? Thank you, Cheryl. Amazing. I... We could have, oh, Morgan, I love your hand up there. That's great. Uh, we couldn't, we could have you go on and we could have served, had deliveries, you know. They call it DoorDash here and all kinds of things so you can get food delivered because we could have lunch with you and dinner. So I hope we'll be doing this again with you. Remember about Echoes and Reflections, all of you that signed up for this, your emails are going to Echoes and Reflections, and am I correct, Cheryl? They'll be getting welcome on board and information on a regular basis from them. Absolutely. And I'll let you be the concluder. How do you like that? Just please, please do the evaluations. It's important for us to continue these sponsorships. Cheryl, you be our concluder. Okay, uh, I will just say thank you again to everyone. Thank you to Gail for putting together the seminar. Thank you for Irvin and Morgan for all the technical support, to Michael for all of his comments. Thank you to Leonard for the beginning and, and, um, and to Roz. Thank you to all of you because hopefully you will take this into the classroom and you will be richer for it and you will pass it along to your kids. It's so important to commemorate and it's so important to hear those voices. And thank you for being here. And it was a real pleasure. What else can I say? Pleasure was mine. Come loved. back tomorrow because, because Jackie and Yoni are terrific and you will not want to miss them. Come back. Jackie is the uh, literature person. Poetry. And uh, Yoni Bur Burroughs is our film. Thank yes. you all. Give our love to Jerusalem. Bye, everybody. Do your evaluations. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>